I will um, describe to you our work in epigenetics using chemical biology to probe the epigenome, and this is part of uh, the Structural Genomics Consortium's effort, um, which I will, which takes place at um, multiple universities, um, shown here. So the SGC has grown into a multi-site organization. Many of you will be familiar with the uh, Oxford site, and we also have a, a strong site in Toronto. So uh, the SGC is a public-private consortium. Uh, we are, uh, collaborate with a number of pharmaceutical companies who help us create these uh, chemical probes, so these um, uh, chemical biology reagents. And I'm going to just, and, and we focus this effort um, mostly so far in the area of epigenetics. And so we've got this great um, tool compound set for the community. So we're making them for you. They are uh, available without restrict to you, for use without restriction and no complicated MTAs. Et cetera, and there's information on our website about um, not only the chemical probes, but a lot of other things we do. Um, so, as I mentioned, what I'll talk to you about today is our work in um, creating, I'll tell you about how we create these chemical reagents, just a teeny bit of biochemistry to start with, uh, and then I'll describe how we're using them in disease models. So the common disease I'll be focusing on is cancer, um, and I'm at a cancer institute, so that's our interest, but it, um, there are elements of differentiation and um, uh, immune system and metabolism in there, so I hope it will be of interest uh, to you. Um, and one of the key things we're trying to do with, to, to use these tools that we're creating is to um, use them in um, more clinically relevant assays. They're not drugs, so they, many of them are, are not always um, good enough to use in animal models, um, but in the case of, of cancer, we're using patient-derived 3D organoids, uh, tumor organoids, for example, and even um, directly um, tissue material. And in the case of non-cancer diseases, um, one can use um, iPS cells differentiated into, um, you know, the tissue type that you're interested in. So they're, they're as I'll show you, they're particularly validated for um, selective inhibition of a given target in uh, cellular assays. So um, with respect to cancer and epigenetics, um, as you know, there are uh, frequent mutations in chromatin regulators. Uh, pretty much all the harm hallmarks of cancer have um, some um, modulation, if you will, by, um, uh, through epigenetics. And so um, about 10 years ago, uh, we, um, the pharmaceutical industry and many others became interested in seeing whether there were therapeutic opportunities in modulating uh, epigenetic proteins. So what are those proteins that we want to, to uh, modulate? Um, this is a nice uh, descript, uh, schematic from um, Bradner and, and Young Lab um, showing all the uh, chromatin-related factors that are involved in, in transcriptional regulation. Um, at, a, at a specific low size, so it's 3D genome, it's epigenome, and many of the proteins that drive um, cancer, particularly oncogenic transcription factors, um, tend not to be druggable, and for many years people have been trying to um, drug P53, try to stabilize it, um, MYC, uh, et cetera, uh, some of them listed here, and they're just not the, the the right um, three-dimensional shape, and they, they're not amenable to binding uh, to drugs. But uh, we and others have shown through our structural biology and, and biochemistry efforts that uh, many of the proteins on which transcription factors rely, chromatin um, regulatory complexes, uh, are, are druggable. And so I'll show you how we're going about um, targeting these proteins. Um, so these are the so-called readers, writers, erasers of uh, chromatin marks. And the three, the three classes that we're focusing on are the uh, are lysine modifications of acetylation and methylation and arginine methylation. And we've heard a little bit about this from some earlier talks um, in, in the meeting. Um, from a structural biology point of view, the reason that these are druggable is because the, the pockets within these proteins that are either the, the catalytic pocket of the enzymes or the, um, the recognition pocket of the reader domains are um, deep and narrow pockets with uh, lined by aromatic uh, uh, residues 
And these make them amenable to binding to drug-like small molecules. And just some examples are shown here. And so as you know, the, um, the histone tails and, and other proteins, uh, both uh, chromatin-related and often uh, non-chromatin-related, uh, are um, full of lysines and arginines that can be modulated. So I will, uh, in, in a little bit, I'll go into some more detail about these. Um, I just want to show you the um, degree of um, characterization and, and validation that we go through to, uh, to make a chemical probe. So the purpose of a chemical probe is to selectively inhibit a given target protein that you're interested in um, so that you can use this compound to um, link its inhibition with uh, a specific phenotype or cellular pathway. And so to do that, you're, uh, the protein, uh, the, the compound needs to be potent. And we start with purified recombinant protein. We do an in vitro assay, um, such as shown here. And we identify um, an active molecule that can inhibit the, uh, the activity. Usually it's an enzymatic or a biochemical binding activity. And an inactive compound that's very closely related, in this case, to enantiomers um, that is not inhibitory. And the, the non-active compound is used as a control because whenever you put a chemical in a cell, it can do many, many things and um, un unanticipated things. And so this controls for the, the chemical scaffold that may have unanticipated off-target effects. They only differ, um, in, in this case, by the mirror image or sometimes um, they differ by just a methyl group, for example. And this allows you to, when you see the activity, um, the phenotypic activity, of interest with the active compound to the enzyme, you know that that's, um, now you're linking phenotype to your specific target, whereas you should not see it for the inactive compound. It's the same with um, your antibody controls and any other controls in biology. Um, you need to use it in chemical biology as well. And so then we also assess these compounds to make sure they're very selective within the protein family. For example, all the methyltransferases, which is an area we focus on. We assay all of them, make sure each compound is selective. Um, we test them uh, to make sure they get into cells without being toxic and, uh, and bind to the endogenous uh, protein in the cell and modulate its biochemical activity. And then we say, OK, it meets these criteria. It's ready to give out to the community to use. Um, and you can derivatize these compounds um, to do uh, some other things. I'll show you a few examples of um, chemoproteomics, for example. And um, all our compounds are available either through us or commercially available. And um, I hope that some of you, I, I, some, of, some of the posters here have already used them. I hope that some of you will use them also in the future. Um, much of the collection is published in these two recent papers shown here the collection of methyltransferase inhibitors. Now, these are protein methyltransferase inhibitors. We haven't worked on DNA uh, methyltransferases, although, um, excitingly, um, GSK has recently developed a DNMT1 selective inhibitor um, that may, hopefully, will get out into the community eventually. Um, uh, and also, um, the bromodilane collection that's primarily from Stefan Knapp's lab um, is also available. So in our lab in Toronto, we focus uh, a lot on pro um, protein methylation. And there are two protein families um, that carry this out, lysine methyltransferases, the so-called set domains. And they um, will uh, mono, dye, and trimethylate uh, lysines, often in histones, but, in, but sometimes in non-histone proteins. And each Mark, is, uh, as you know, is a different signal. Uh, and then there's arginine methylation, which comes in the mono, um, asymmetric uh, dimethylation and symmetric dimethylation. And these are different signals that can modulate activity of proteins as well. So we've made inhibitors. The little symbols are the proteins for which we've made inhibitors, too. Um, as I mentioned, selectivity is an important um, aspect. And the, the set domain methyltransferases are um, sort of naturally set up to um, be able to exploit for sele making selective small molecule inhibitors. And this is shown here. So here we have substrates, histone substrates for the various, uh, these methyltransferases shown here. 
where we align the lysine that gets modified. Uh, and you can see the sequence that they recognize very selectively. This is um, K9 uh, methyl sequence, and this is the H4 K20 uh, lysine sequence. And, um, and so they recognize the sequence quite um, specifically, and that's shown here with the, the recognition peptide is in purple, and the lysine is going down into the plane uh, of the slide here. And you can see at the minus one uh, residue position, or minus two or minus three, the sequence is different, and there's these very specific pockets that each protein can recognize. So this each groove here that recognizes the substrate is very unique, and we can exploit that to uh, identify very selective um, drug-like small molecules, as shown there. So this just summarizes the selectivity, and the point here is that for any given um, small molecule, for example, this one shown here, you can see it does not inhibit, react uh, with any of the others. A few of them are a bit um, broader. This is an arginine methyltransferase that inhibits all of the class one arginine methyltransferases, and, but the rest are um, even more selective than that. So um, the last little bit of biochemistry here is that, um, so here again are the phylogenetic trees of the enzyme domain of all, all these enzymes. These are the set domains. These are the arginine methyltransferases and a uh, subclass of methyl, uh, lysine methyltransferases. And so we've identified a number of different ways to inhibit these. They all use the universal uh, methyl donor, s adenosyl methionine, so that's the cofactor. And um, some of the inhibitors are competitive with a cofactor and prevent it from binding. Um, but more often, as I mentioned, um, we've been able to identify compounds that bind in the substrate binding groove, um, as shown for these proteins here. Okay, in uh, a couple cases, we've identified um, allosteric regulators of the arginine methyltransferases that prevent the dimer from coming together. And um, more interestingly, and I'll show you an example of this, are the, the, the subset of um, set domains shown here. Um, EZH2 and the MLL subfamily that, are, that require multi-protein uh, complexes in order for the, that, those enzymes to be active. And um, we and others have identified um, inhibitors of protein-protein interactions within the, that, those complexes that disrupt the protein interaction and, then, um, and, and thereby inactivate the enzymes. And finally, um, I, what I won't have time to talk about today is um, Inhi inhibition of the um, PWWP domain of the NSD2 and NSD3 uh, enzymes, and that, that inhibits the PWP domain interaction with, uh, with chromatin, with HVK36 uh, dyne trimethyl mark, and um, it does not affect the catalytic activity of the proteins. Um, and these are, one is just about to be published, and the other one is uh, being submitted soon. So hopefully in the, in the future there'll be more data on that. So in, um, in aggregate, we've identified uh, a number of inhibitors to most of the major um, methylation marks in chromatin. And some of these enzymes, as I mentioned, have activity um, outside of chromatin or uh, are on non-histone proteins, uh, as shown here. But most of the major marks, um, we've got an inhibitor for. I'm going to get to uh, describe to you an example that walks you through how we develop these um, inhibitors uh, and also um, how we've used one of them, inhibitor of the, um, uh, of the activity of the MLL1 protein um, as a first example. And then I will uh, talk about a couple other um, studies where we use the collection uh, of inhibitors to identify potential therapeutic targets in, in cancer models. So ML01, as you know, it's a component, it's a trithorax protein. Uh, it tr it's responsible for trimethylation of H3K4, which um, is involved in transcriptional activation. You can create a, um, the minimal um, catalytic active uh, protein complex of this very large protein complex by these proteins uh, here. And it's absolutely required to have this WDR5 subunit. Uh, within the complex that helps hold it together and binds to a specific sequence of the MLL protein. And so this is WDR5 shown here. We 
solved its three-dimensional structure a few years ago. And it's a donut-shaped uh, molecule. The, um, the WD40 domain is the second largest uh, protein domain in the human genome um, besides, besides zinc fingers. And you can see this has a, a beautiful pocket right in the middle of the donut that likes to bind um, drug-like small molecules, uh, including this one that we had, uh, identified through a, a screen of a, a chemical library. And it competes with the native peptide, as shown here in a peptide, uh, oh, this is IT, ITC, but you know, also in a peptide displacement assay. Uh, so this is the MLL peptide that binds to WDR5, and WDR5 helps hold this complex together, so we're trying to inhibit that <laughs> interaction. Um, and interestingly, the peptide binds through this arginine um, shown here, and uh, it also binds to um, histone, uh, the histone tail uh, sequence here, in which, uh, in the same, it will bind to both. Um, and the, um, the arginine that binds here is, uh, binds even better when it's methylated. So um, arginine methylation impinges um, uh, and, and, and on the system. And I'll, talk, I'll give you a story on arginine methylation a little bit later. So, um, so our initial compound here is seven micromolar uh, binding affinity, but it is not, um, it's not potent enough to uh, be a chemical probe. So we are, um, we worked further with medicinal chemists um, in our, uh, adjacent to our institute, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, who through uh, cycles of um, testing and structural biology and medicinal chemistry and retesting again, uh, optimize the initial hit compound into this uh, compound that is uh, very potent now in the nanomolar range. The inactive control that just differs by oxygen here instead of nitrogen is, uh, is, has no activity. So we use the, the pair together and you can see that it competes with uh, the peptide binding group. Okay, so we can do things like, uh, because we know from the 3D structure that you can modify it out here and it sticks out into the, uh, away from the protein, that it, um, you can modify it with no effect on the binding affinity. So we can make this linker, put a biotin, and do things like um, pull down studies to show that the compound will uh, pull down WDR5 from cells and that you can compete it off with the uh, free uh, chemical probe, the unbiotinized version. And you can do this with a mass spec readout and show that in a cell that it is very selective for WDR5. And so now we want to know, is it, does it functionally affect WDR5's uh, activity in cells and MLL's uh, activity? And so um, Dahlia Barsight did this work um, with putting a flag tag on WDR5. You can pull it, pull it down out of the cell lysates and show that it brings down MLL, three different replicates, and in a dose-dependent manner, you can compete off um, you can compete off the MLL with the, uh, with the, with the chemical probe, so it's disrupting WDR5 MLL interaction. And at the same time, you lose interaction with RBBP5, the other key subunit in the minimal trimeric complex, and that's just quantified here. Um, and then, yeah, so the, the full complex, recent cryo-EM structure very nicely was uh, published recently, um, is more complex, but nevertheless, we can still get a, an inhibition of the effective um, um, protein, uh, uh, catalytic activity of the protein uh, with this inhibitor. So we've used it now to, um, in collaboration with Julio Saperti Perga in, in Vienna, um, whose um, postdoc Florian Grabian had identified that WDR5 was aberrantly um, regulating um, or driving um, uh, the CVP alpha uh, specific mutation, a P30 mutation, that um, apparently recruited the MLO complex to the uh, loci of this transcription factor, which drives a, a leukemic gene expression program. Uh, and in their uh, genetic work, they showed that if you knock out um, WDR5, that you no longer get the MLL recruitment and the cells um, differentiate and you get a uh, uh, resolution of the leukemia. And our inhibitor now uh, phenocopies uh, that 
uh, in both the mouse system and uh, patient-derived cells. And that was published a few years ago. Similarly, um, Shelley Berger was studying gain-of-function mutant p53, which um, apparently interacted with the ETS2 protein in certain breast cancer cell lines, and uh, by doing so, activated transcription of the MLL uh, proteins. And she showed that with uh, application of the WDR5 inhibitor that um, you got a downregulation of that MLL program and um, a reduction in, in uh, cell, uh, cancer cell pro proliferation. So our collection here of um, chemical probes are all um, sort of uh, validated and characterized to that extent. Um, they're, they're potent, they're active, collect uh, and selective in cells, and so when you see a phenotype, such as those growth suppression phenotypes um, that I described, you can reliably, or more reliably, relate them to inhibition of that specific target. Now, a number of these, um, including the ones in, uh, in uh, circle in yellow, the protein targets are the subject of um, clinical uh, drug development or um, late-stage preclinical drug development. And so one of the things we're doing is taking this entire collection and asking questions in a disease model, which of these compounds uh, has a desired uh, phenotypic effect in cancer. It's often um, uh, growth suppression or, or killing of the cancer cells or triggering a differentiation in a, those types of cancers that have a block to differentiation. Uh, and even though these are not the drugs, I think if you can use them in a very um, uh, mechanistic way to understand what's going on in those, uh, in those cells, and I think that's valuable information for um, the drug discovery and the drug development community to uh, decide what, uh, what types of disease uh, to, to use in their trials, uh, bi biomarkers for the pa uh, patient populations that will be susceptible, et cetera. So I'll give you, uh, in the last half of the talk, I'll give you a couple uh, short stories on that. So towards that end, um, colleagues at Princess Margaret Cancer Center uh, and, uh, and us and also um, Hospital for Sick Children have been using these um, patient-derived cellular systems to, um, to screen the entire collection of chemical probes, not just the methyltransferases, but bromodebanes and, and others. And so we are looking at um, glioma uh, brain tumors, um, a pediatric brain tumor, a colorectal cancer, a subset of poor prognosis, um, AML, leukemia samples, and clear cell renal carcinoma, and also um, breast cancer, which I haven't shown here. And you can see that for a given uh, chemical probe, a lot of them don't do anything in, in most models, and that's, uh, that's good. Uh, some of them are frequent um, hitters across all cancer types, for example, JQ1 and related VET bromodomain inhibitors are well known to suppress growth in cancer. EZH2 is effective in some contexts, but not all. Not much activity at all in brain cancers. Um, a strong effect in colorectal cancer, and I'll explain to you how we think that works. And um, in some cases of AML, but not in others. Uh, and then I'll also tell you a story about PMT5 inhibition in brain cancer. Um, Christian Helen, uh, described some nice work um, earlier on PRMT5 inhibition, and uh, our results echoes uh, some of the things he described there. So um, EZH2 in colorectal cancer, um, we have, here's the inhibitor, here's the inactive control, and their activity in vitro. And um, postdoc in the lab, Evelyn Lima Fernandez, was working with um, patient-derived tumor organoids, so these are 3D um, systems that are uh, grown in media that enrich for the uh, stem cell component or the tumor-initiating uh, uh, cells. And uh, across a number of cell lines, she screened the chemical probe collection and identified EZH2 as uh, having a very strong activity. And because we were interested in the, the cancer stem cell um, issue or, or potential we were trying to target the cancer stem cells in the system. We, we uh, focused on EZH2 as opposed to a couple of these others, like uh, the, the VET inhibitors, where a lot of other work had been going on, um, because of the developmental links of EZH2. So the inhibitor 
you can see uh, reduce in a dose dependent manner, reduces the HPK uh, uh, K27 trimethyl mark, decreases the dimethyl mark. Interestingly, you get some of an increase in the monomethyl mark. And this is across a uh, collection of different um, patient drive models. The inactive control is uh, the green, so there's not any effect with that. And you see a reduction in uh, proliferation with the active compound. So this is relevant for uh, colon cancer because um, in this, uh, it's been reported in many, uh, in many papers as well, but in this uh, internal um, patient uh, tumor microarray, we can see a strong um, upregulation or upregulation relative to normal tissue of EZH2 in the, in the tumor tissue. Interestingly, um, if you take exactly the same cell preparation and you grow it in, um, in serum, so this is serum, you don't, the, the cells are become in a more, a more differentiated state and we don't see any effect of EZH2 inhibition on uh, proliferation. But in these uh, colon cancer initiating cell um, enriched 3D systems, you, see, you do see the effect. And so um, we use a limiting dilution assay to uh, quantify the effect. Um, so this is um, looking at the uh, percentage of tumor initiating cells in the population, um, either um, just with vehicle or with ECH2 inhibition. And you can see that it reduces the tumor initiating capacity. So the other thing, uh, so, so then we, this, this compound is uh, able to be used in the mouse models. And so if we do a, a, a patient-derived xenograph, you can see that we get about a 50% reduction in the tumor size. We were only able to get, with this agent, uh, about a 50% reduction in the mark. And so we think we had a better pharmacological agent um, that, and could drive down that, um, the mark even more, as we can in cells, that we might get further reduction in the tumor size. Um, we also wanted to, um, to, to further demonstrate that this is really target, one of the contributions is targeting the cell, uh, stem cell compartment. Uh, we did an in vitro limited dilution assay. So we started by treating, um, injecting the mice with the tumor cells, treating for 20 days, and we stop, we take the tumor out, and we dilute down the number of cells injected into new mice, and let them grow, uh, and in this case, we had a reduction in the uh, tumor initiating capacity. And then we keep going and take those tumors and inject them again. And so now we're out to um, well over 70 days since it had seen uh, the drug. And uh, we still get further reduction in the tumor initiating capacity. So we think we're having a, an effect on the stem compartment. And, um, and so we wanted to further understand how this was working. So we looked at um, the, um, the, we did uh, some epi uh, epigenomic analysis and, uh, and ataxy and looked for the genes that were um, marked with H3K27 trimethyl before treatment and were upregulated by RNA-seq uh, upon application of the compound. And this is a set of genes and this is, these are the GO terms that were identified and um, of interest was the Indian hedgehog gene, which is a known um, uh, uh, PRC2 um, regulate, uh, target gene. It is also the primary um, differentiation um, uh, uh, agent uh, or, or factor for, um, for colonic differentiation. And in the RNA-seq, you could see um, upregulation, at least three different models of uh, the uh, RNA for Indian hedgehog. So we think that we're now um, increasing, well, we've shown that we're increasing expression of IHH. Um, it looks like this is a case of bivalency where the promoter of IHH is marked by both the uh, K27 trimethyl mark and activating H3K4 mark. And now if we apply the, the chemical probe to remove this mark, you have an activated state and you get gene expression. And then the hedgehog pathway um, 
one of the Rivera questions, which was a good question, was is the hedgehog pathway um, active in these, uh, in these cells? And the answer is yes, the receptors are expressed. The, um, the downstream transcription factors are open by ataxic. If we use a hedgehog pathway inhibitor, we rescue this growth suppressive effect um, of the UNC, in, uh, of the PRC2 inhibitor. And um, remarkably, we can use recombinant Indian hedgehog uh, to, um, uh, to uh, replicate this, uh, this effect uh, as shown here and upregulate the um, downstream, um, downstream hedgehog uh, transcription factors. Okay. So um, we think we have a, uh, what's happening here is we have a pseudo differentiation uh, triggered by uh, removing the repressive HBK27 trimethyl mark at um, the hedgehog, uh, Indian hedgehog pathway. So um, the cells are um, uh, differentiating to some extent, um, but not fully differentiated into, uh, in, into a, a terminal state, but nevertheless it has a growth suppressive effect. Um, but as I said, we were never able to get really um, a really good uh, suppression of the tumor mark. So we thought, what if we combine it with, um, with the standard of care chemotherapy? Um, now this is a, a concept when we're using epigenetic inhibitors that I, I think um, one needs to think about. Epigenetic inhibitors are slow acting. It takes, usually takes about three days to get a reduction in the mark and it takes another further four or five days, even a week or more, to see the full phenotypic effect. And so, but chemotherapy is much faster acting, right? So what we thought we'd do is first um, apply the epigenetic inhibitor, then, um, then uh, chemotherapy, and then interleave it uh, as shown here. So that's the protocol that we used, and we got um, a nice reduction in, um, in cell and in, in tumor size this way. And I think this is going to be um, a future application of epigenetic drugs in the, in the clinic is, uh, at least in cancer, is uh, combinations with either uh, no other known therapies, other targeted therapies, and uh, chemotherapy. And so the timing, working out the timing is going to be a, uh, an issue that will need to be addressed. So in summary, um, the uh, ESH2 inhibition in colorectal cancer suppresses growth decreases the frequency of colon cancer initiating cells, triggers a pseudo differentiation by derepressing Indian hedgehog and uh, can resensitize cells to uh, low dose chemotherapy. Um, and I think the implications are that the uh, elimination of the cancer stem cells um, is thought to be maybe um, favorable for preventing relapse. And uh, it may, may explain why the, the drug Vizimotogib which inhibits all the hedgehog pathway, uh, all three hedgehog uh, proteins, um, failed to um, have any efficacy in colorectal cancer because uh, perhaps you need that, that pathway to be open. Um, and um, and it, from a sort of a, a mechanistic point of view relative to, to um, uh, stem cells, that the uh, these, stem, these colorectal cancer stem cells are still are able to respond to a, a normal differentiation signal, such as Indian hedgehog, if if it can uh, if it can get that signal. And in the, in the um, natural state of those cancers, that signal was suppressed. So now I will um, switch to two more short um, vignettes um, of uh, other um, patient-derived models that we've been working with, and the next one is is this um, study by um, postdoc uh, Patty Sackemutter, who uh, has studied the glioblastoma and, uh, again, used the collection of chemical probes to look for compounds that were going to inhibit growth and the stem, uh, the stem cell capacity uh, in these tumors. And uh, as you can see here, we get a signal from JQ1 and a strong signal from both these two compounds that are both um, PRMT5 inhibitors, so protein arginine methyltransferase 5. Um, each con the, the two active compounds are, um, have different modes of action, so the fact that both are active um, 
it is highly suggestive that it's the PRMP5 effect and the inactive control um, does not show this effect. So just a refresher what arginine um, methylation involves. So there's, um, these are the um, methyl, arginine methyltransferases in human, there's not too many. Um, you can get asymmetric dimethylation, symmetric dimethylation, and PRMT5 is the, one of the, the major um, driver of that. And um, in the lone PRMT7 uh, mon monomethylates. Both these guys can mono and then dimethylate, um, and this one is just a monomethylase. The major targets are um, historically histones, but probably, um, as I'll show you, um, at least in this case, and, and, and for many cases of inhibition of these, strong effects on RNA binding proteins and splicing machinery. And that's because these methylate um, arginine, uh, arginines in the context of uh, sequence, it's RGG, uh, uh, RG, RG sequences that are very abundant in RNA binding proteins and the splicing machinery. So um, we noticed this activity. Um, two different compounds, so the red is always going to be um, GSK591, and the blue is going to be uh, Lily283, um, developed respectively in these two uh, companies. Uh, and so you can see that both of them reduce the um, symmetric dimethylation mark, so they're getting in the cells, they're effective, and they reduce the sphere forming capacity, which is a um, surrogate for um, a stemness in, the, in this system. So we wanted to understand what's going on in the cells that um, reduce this growth, and we don't see strong apoptosis or, or cell killing. What we see is an in, in, um, enrichment in um, expression of uh, cells involved in splicing and in, in, in downregulation of uh, uh, proteins involved in DNA repair, and particularly the cell cycle. So if we look deeper at the RNA-seq data and look at splicing events, because we know these uh, arginine methylation is involved in splicing, you can see a strong effect on um, different types of splicing events. Um, and if you look at, for, at the GO terms for those proteins who have major splicing anomalies, um, they all focus on a cell cycle here. So what we think is happening is you, you're getting uh, massive defects in the, in the spliceome, if you will, of the, of the cell that affects the ability of, these, uh, of the cell to go through the cell cycle. And indeed, we see that the cells kind of just arrest and stop growing. Um, we're very interested in, in using uh, l larger collections of patient-derived samples to see if we can correlate the degree of response to um, a given inhibitor. And um, in this case, we have this large collection through a Stand Up to Cancer uh, project. And you can see the two inhibitors track nicely. Um, the Lily compound is more potent, and that's why it seems to be, it's more, a little more effective in each case, but they all track the same. So we have poor responders and we have very good responders, as shown here. Um, and we've looked really hard for um, clear biomarkers of response. and. Um, many of the uh, proposed factors in, uh, in the literature that have been published uh, do not correlate, at least in brain cancer. Um, the best we could do so far is this um, segregation of a pre-existing splicing pattern in the, um, the, most, the, the poorest responding uh, cells and the best responding cells, and that's shown here. Now, we don't know what the biology is that's associated with, with um, these genes and their uh, different splice forms, but statistically this was um, the only thing that sort of segregated poor responders from good responders. And we're going to try to see if we can figure out um, more of what's going on here. Um, but nevertheless, we think that this can, um, uh, in the future, may help um, guide a lot of activity that's going on in the clinic right now. And to that effect, um, we um, use uh, an orthotopic um, PDX model uh, shown here, and the, it turns out, so this is brain cancer, you have to get the, con the, the drug into the brain. The Lily compound does have um, brain penetrance, CNS penetrance, so we were able to use this in an orthotopic model, and you get um, very strong reduction of the tumor size and extension of lifespan shown here. 
and uh, concomitant reduction in the mark in the uh, tumor or brain, uh, brain tissue. So um, uh, that's about the end of this story, but we're hoping that this data will, on uh, GBM will inspire the multiple companies who have PRMT5 inhibitors starting in phase one uh, oncology trials to, to uh, focus and have a closer look at uh, GBM as an indication. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to go through this part quickly. I'll, um, this is published, so I'll just um, summarize it quickly. Um, Ching Wu was interested in uh, triple negative breast cancer, NBC, and um, because she was interested in, in characterizing, or she was characterizing, the activity of uh, the glucose transporter inhibitor, inhibitor of glucose transporter one, because it's upregulated in, uh, in uh, breast cancer, TNBC in particular, and it fuels the glycolysis cycle to, um, uh, to help the cells grow. And she, was, and she had certain um, cell lines shown here that were non-responsive to um, the Bay, uh, uh, Bay inhibitor by itself, and she wanted to find a, a, an ec epigenetic um, sensitizer to, um, to inhibition of GLUT1. And so she looked at the bromo domains uh, in particular and found this uh, striking example where um, each compound in it, uh, in its, by itself had no effect, but we got a strong growth suppression with, by combining this uh, OF1, which inhibits BRPF1, 2, and 3, uh, and, um, and the GLUT1 inhibition. So this is shown. You can mimic this by decreasing the glucose level in the media, and you can see the segregation of the um, uh, Bay treatment uh, versus no treatment shown here. And you get a, and upon um, a Bay treatment, you get a re, uh, overall reduction in methylation, uh, or sorry, acetylation now on the um, H3 uh, histone tail. So what is BRPF1, 2, and 3? It's a component of the HBO1 complex. And um, there's a little bit of difference in the literature, but I think it's, it's agreed that it, um, at least BRPF2 and 3 are um, key components of the methylase that meth uh, deposits the H3K14 acetyl mark. And so Ching uh, did knockdown of um, all three individually and then um, and the, and the combination of 2 and 3. And you can see with a uh, knockdown of BRPF2 and 3, you get a complete reduction of the uh, K14 acetyl mark and reduction uh, in the viability of the cells. And so um, this is some more um, validation. But what we think is happening here is you have uh, cancer cells that are highly dependent on the glycolysis cycle. Um, you inhibit glucose uptake, so you put a stress on this, and you're going to decrease the amount of acetyl-CoA. And now you have the HBO1, and um, in particular, it seems that this uh, HBO1 is uh, the most sensitive to this lower level, and now you get a reduction in the H3K14, which is detrimental to the cells. So um, I'll just leave you with the final um, take-home message that um, in immune cells, you also have very strong effect of these compounds. Um, so in differentiation down the different T-cell lineages, um, this is also published, um, you get a strong skewing of the different lineages uh, depending on um, which type of methyltransferase one applies. And colleagues um, in our institute and elsewhere have used um, these as a strategy to modulate uh, T-cells, which will be very important in uh, immunotherapy applications. So in summary, Open science chemical probes, these are all available for any of you to use if you like. And in our studies, um, we've shown um, that they can promote differentiation and growth arrest in cancers. Um, use of epigenetic inhibitors can, uh, is going to be useful, I think, to potentiate uh, activity of potential, uh, conventional drugs and um, has a strong potential for a mod modulation of the immune system, amongst other things. Um, so let me thank my many colleagues at the SGC, um, shown here, and colleagues at Princess Margaret and um, SickKids, 
And I particularly like to thank um, all of the medicinal chemists, and I haven't talked, spoken anything about the chemistry that's involved in developing these kinds of um, inhibitors, but um, in both academic uh, chemists and the pharmaceutical company scientists who help us make these compounds and let us give them out to anybody to use. So thank you very much. Questions? Cheryl, that was really amazing. Um, I wanted to see if we could go back to something you said at the beginning about the, the, the poor drug ability of transcription factors. So a lot of the stuff that we're seeing here that you're focusing on, which is very cancer specific, and that's appropriate at this stage of the game, but for a lot of the diseases that we're going to want to try to intervene in, like diabetes and fatty liver disease and so on, it's, it's probably going to require something a little bit less of a sledgehammer and something a little bit more focused. Mm -hmm. And it, it occurs to me that think there are PPAR gamma and other transcription factor drugs out there at the moment, so perhaps you could expand on the challenges in this area. Yeah, so, so I do not have circled the, um, the ligand-dependent transcription factors because, of course, they are druggable. Um, but these are the sequence-specific transcription factors that are not regulated by a, a ligand uh, pinch. So to your question about, um, yeah, we don't want a sledgehammer if you're trying to do neuro neurological disease and, and, or chronic disease as people are going to have to take a drug for a long time. I think the hopeful thing is that, as you saw, um, many of those uh, compounds do not really do much of anything in, in the cancer cells that we saw and also in, um, you know, just regular cell lines. And I think it's going to be, um, I think there's a strong role for, um, uh, for empirical um, studies where you have a phenotype that you want to modify um, and you use a well-characterized well and defined compound such as these and say um, which compound affects the phenotype that I'm looking for. And, and then you have to figure out the mechanism, which is a lot of work. But I think there's a lot of potential for that type of approach. And others have used some of our compounds for very interesting things, like reactivating uh, fetal hemoglobin and um, hemoglobinopathies, um, for example, things like that. That's a great talk. This is a small lecture, actually. I was wondering how Selective is, is using the metatransferase inhibitors. I mean, they involved, as you say, there's histone, RNA, but how? Or is this like this one of the big challenges that for future for us if we want to target this one? So you are targeting, you are inhibiting um, that enzyme in all the cells which you're applying it to. But um, as you know, the epigenome in every cell type is different, including disease cells. So it, it will, um, I think it's a matter of therapeutic window and, and what's going on in a specific cell type relative to others. Whether, um, what, what difference you'll have. So, so you have to look in the cell type of interest and, and also have your control cells uh, and ultimately, um, ultimately in an animal system. And, you know, for those sledgehammer compounds that, that stop the cancer growth, we still were able to um, use them in animal systems and the mice were, you know, they weren't entirely happy, but they were, they, they were su survived use of those uh, tool compounds and reduction of the tumor. So um, I, think, I think there's hope. <laughs> I have a quick question, Cheryl. Uh, the process of probe screening, it can be very empirical. You can screen like millions and millions of different compounds, or it can be more rational, and you kind of come up with some ideas what kind of specific molecule would fit into that pocket. So what is, what is, how, how do you do that in, in real life? Right, to identify the first molecule that we can then optimize into a chemical probe, yeah. Um, depending on the protein, so bromo domains, there's a, a lot, there, there are certain chemical scaffolds that are known in, in, in modeling and um, in uh, changing, you know, a, a BET inhibitor into inhibitor of a, a, another bromo domain and make it selective. That's possible. Methyl transferase is much harder. Every, every um, enzyme in that case, we had to find a de novo new inhibitor, and that required a lot of screening of different, a diverse set of compounds. Um, in other cases, um, computational methods, docking, uh, you know, using millions of molecules, 
computationally to dock into a, a nice preform site. That has also been successful. We use that on PWWP domain of NSD2. So to what extent artificial intelligence is helping you? It looks like so far, like so far it hasn't, but we're hopeful that in the future it, it, we'll be able to use AI to help with this process, yeah. Yeah, so I'm interested on your, t uh, your immunotherapy that targets T cells. Is it preventing the activation of T cells, or is it something about the differentiation? Um, so all I meant to show there was that um, it'll, so this slide um, shows that you can alter, you can increase the population, for example, of the TH17 lineage um, from a naive T cell when you apply, this is uh, the dot one l inhibitor, right? And so um, it's not a single, it's not a therapy. These are just the effects of the different <laughs> inhibitors on the lineage um, skew. So that the bar here means um, increase or decrease relative to uh, control. So they will have effect on T cell differentiation depending on the compound and, and the, in the lineage or the, or the stimulation that's uh, um, driving the differentiation. So for example, um, G9A inhibitors increase Treg. And in cancer, you do not want increase in Treg because that suppresses immune response. But in autoimmune disease, you do want more Treg. So there's uh, my, my colleague, um, uh, Colby Zaff, uh, who's postdoc to this work, is actually has a lot going on with, um, with G9A and, and Treg in, in immune uh, inflammation assays. And then, um, so, and, and then uh, Neto Hirano um, did similar screens. Looking, he, again, he was looking for a very specific phenotype for this adoptive immunotherapy model, where they take the cells out of the patient, um, stimulate them, and then put them back in the patient. And um, what he was looking for in the first case was um, a, fact, a, a compound that you could treat the cells ex vivo so that they would last longer. They would have a longer effect in the patient when you put them back, although the patients here were mice. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Yep. So that closes our last session. <clears throat> and now we have... <clears throat>